Hello, this is the lecture on Chapter 3. If you want to rip it from YouTube and put it on an iPod to listen to it with headphones, you may certainly do so. You may also take notes and include it in your outline for obvious reasons. So, good luck and take your time and take notes. Start early so you're not rushing through it. It's a very important material for the entire course. All right, this is a picture of the Mars rover. We have been exploring Mars for many years, and there is talk about sending a manned spaceship to Mars. Uh, possibly one of you could be on that manned mission. Who knows? On January 4, 2004, the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit landed on Mars. Equipped with five scientific instruments and a rock abrasion tool, shown at left, Spirit was sent to examine the Martian surface around Gusev Crater, a wide basin that may have once been a lake. Each day of its mission, Spirit recorded measurements for analysis. This data helped scientists learn about the geology and climate on Mars. All measurements have some uncertainty, as we've been learning. In the chemistry laboratory, you must strive for accuracy and precision in your measurements. Now remember, this class, this uh, course, this chapter is going to be about measurement and precision and accuracy and how to report data. Your height, 67 inches, that's in American. Your weight, 134 pounds, again in American. And the speed you drive on the highway, 65 miles per hour, are some familiar examples of measurements. Uh, perhaps not, perhaps you're European and those are not familiar to you. A measurement is a quantity that has both a number and a unit. Everyone makes and uses measurements. For instance, you decide how to dress in the morning based on the temperature outside. If you were baking cookies, you would measure the volumes of the ingredients as indicated in the recipe. Such everyday situations are similar to those faced by scientists. Measurements are fundamental to the experimental sciences. So therefore, we have to read all instruments the same way. If you are in another country, uh, taking measurements, somebody in another country other than yours must be able to read your results. For that reason, it is important to be able to make measurements and to decide whether a measurement is correct. The units typically used in the sciences are those of the International System of Measurements, SI. In, in chemistry, you will often encounter very large or very small numbers. A single gram of hydrogen, for example, contains approximately 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atoms. The mass of an atom of gold is listed there. Writing and using such large and small numbers is very cumbersome. You can work more easily with these numbers by writing them in scientific or exponential notation. In scientific notation, a given number is written as the product of two numbers, a coefficient and 10 raised to a power. For example, the number 6, well, it's listed there, uh, 6, 0, 2, and then a whole bunch of zeros. Written in scientific notation would be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. The coefficient in this number is 6.02. In scientific notation, the coefficient is always a number equal to or greater than 1 and less than 10. The power of 10, or exponent, is in this example is 23. Figure 1 on the next slide illustrates how to express the number of stars in the galaxy by using scientific notation. For more practice on writing numbers in scientific notation, refer to page R56, Appendix C. Here is an example of scientific notation. There's no significant figures there, uh, other than the two, according to the way it's written. And it would be 2 times 10 to the 11th. Decimal moves 11 places to the left, and you uh, 
leave out the sigma mean figures, and then you count the appropriate spaces for the base 10, uh, expressing very large numbers, such as estimated number of stars in the galaxy, is easier if scientific notation is used. It's just an easier way of doing it. There's not anything different with that. You have the factor on the left and the exponential expression on the right, and that's all it is. So the scientific notation uh, uses only sigma mean figures. You put the sigma mean figure with the highest in the highest place value on the left of the decimal, the rest of them on the right, and then you correct uh, the value with base 10 so that the former equals the latter. Your success in the chemistry lab and in many of your daily activities depends on your ability to make reliable measurements. Ideally, measurements should be both correct and reproducible. Accuracy and precision, correctness and reproducibility relate to the concepts of accuracy and precision, two words that mean the same thing to many people. In chemistry, however, their meanings are quite different. Accuracy is a measure of how close a measurement comes to the actual or true value of whatever it is measured. Precision is a measure of how close a series of measurements are to one another. Uh, so in other words, you have to have a standard. Accuracy re re requires a standard, and precision it may not be correct at all, but the values have to be related to one another. To evaluate the accuracy of a measurement, the measured value must be compared to the correct value. To evaluate the precision of a measurement, you must compare the values of two or more repeated measurements. Darts on a dartboard illustrate accuracy and precision in measurement. Let the bullseye of the dartboard represent the true or correct value of what you are measuring. The closeness of a dart to the bullseye corresponds to the degree of accuracy. The closer it comes to the bullseye, the more accurately the dart was thrown. The closeness of several darts to one another corresponds to the degree of precision. And in the next slide, you'll see uh, an example of dartboards. You'll see a, 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 uh, an illustration, figure two. The distribution of the darts illustrates the difference between accuracy and precision. Figure two, the distribution of darts illustrates the difference between accuracy and precision. A, good accuracy and good precision. The darts are close to the bullseye and to one another. B, poor accuracy and good precision. The darts are far from the bullseye but close to one another. Poor accuracy and poor precision. For C, the darts are far from the bullseye and from one another. So this is a classic kind of... Uh, illustration of accuracy and precision. Not a perfect one, but uh, fair enough. It certainly tells the story. The closer together the darts are, the greater the precision and the reproducibility. Look at figure two as you consider the following outcomes. All of the darts land close to the bullseye and to one another. Closeness to the bullseye means that the degree of accuracy is great. Each dart in the bullseyes correspond to an accurate measurement of a value. Closeness of the dart to one another illustrates or indicates high precision. B. All of the darts land close to one another but far from the bullseye. The precision is high because of the closeness of the grouping and thus the high level of reproducibility. Remember reproducibility is a very important element in any type of experimentation. People who want to verify your results hopefully will reproduce those results and the verification is, is there. Here's again the uh, illustration of the darts with A, B, and C indicating the relative accuracy and precision in each 
So let's continue with the next slide. The results are inaccurate, however, because of the distance of the darts from the bullseye. C. The darts land far from one another and from the bullseye. The results are both inaccurate and imprecise. Determining error, note that an individual measurement may be accurate or inaccurate. Suppose you use a thermometer to measure the boiling point of pure water at standard pressure. The thermometer reads 99.1 degrees Celsius. You probably know that the true or accepted value of the boiling point of water under these conditions is actually 100 degrees Celsius. There is a difference between the accepted value, which is the correct value based on reliable references, and the experimental value, the value measured in the lab. The difference between the experimental value and the accepted value is called the error. And there's the equation. Error equals experimental value minus accepted value. Error can be positive or negative depending on whether the experimental value is greater than or less than the accepted value. For the boiling point of water, the error is going to be negative 0.9 degrees Celsius. The error, however, is going to be an absolute value. Uh, error is absolute value. We don't really say that it has negative or positive uh, value. We just simply say that it's absolute and that we're lo just looking at the magnitude or the difference uh, and no sign needed. The magnitude of the error shows the amount, again, the magnitude, not the direction, of the error shows the amount by which the experimental value differs from the accepted value. Often it is useful to calculate the relative error or percent error. The percent error is the absolute value of the error, that's what I said, divided by the accepted value multiplied by 100 percent, and that's going to equal the percent or relative error. Using the absolute value of the error means that the percent error will always be a positive value. For the boiling point measurement, the percent error is calculated as follows. Here is the uh, percent error continued. So it's going to be the absolute value of the difference in the theoretical and the observed, or theoretical and the experimental, divided by 100 times 100, and that's going to equal 0.9%. Just because a measuring device works doesn't necessarily mean that it is accurate. As figure 3 shows, a weighing scale that does not read zero when nothing is on it is bound to yield error. In order to weigh yourself accurately, you must first make sure that the scale is zeroed. We always zero scales in, uh, in chemistry. We make sure that it's reading from zero, uh, and then we can proceed. So the next slide is going to illustrate this fact. And what you want to do is uh, the left scale, if it's not zeroed, then the right scale will be inaccurate. So it's the error is 10 uh, kilograms, so or 10 pounds, whatever the case may be. The scale below has not been properly zeroed, so the reading obtained for the person's weight is inaccurate. There is a difference between the person's correct weight and <coughs> the measured weight. Uh, figure four, the precision of a weighing scale depends on how finely uh, it is calibrated. And you see scales and, and uh, things to weigh materials uh, all the time, uh, in, especially in grocery stores or farm markets where uh, you have price per pound, and the material has to be weighed, and then the uh, sticker put on it for how much you have to pay for it. Supermarkets often provide scales like the one in figure four in the former slide. Customers use these scales to measure the weight of produce, that is, price per pound. If you use a scale that is calibrated in 0.1 pound intervals, you can easily read the scale to the nearest tenth of a pound. With such a scale, however, you can also estimate the weight to the nearest hundredth 
of a pound by noting the position of the pointer between calibration marks. That's the estimated place value. Suppose you estimate a weight that lies between 2.4 pounds and 2.5 pounds to be 2.46 pounds. The number in this estimated measurement has three digits. The first two digits in the measurement, two and four, are known with certainty. And <clears throat> it's going, you're going to see in the next slide that the six is known with uncertainty. And it's going to have a uncertainty of 0 0.01. So let's see what that next slide says. Now remember, the reading was 2.46. Six was the estimation. But the rightmost digit, six, has been estimated and involves some uncertainty. These three reported digits all convey useful information, however, and are called significant figures. The significant figures in a measurement include all of the digits that are known, plus a last digit that is estimated. Measurements must always be reported to the correct number of significant figures because calculated answers often depend on the number of significant figures in the values used in the calculation. Instruments differ in the number of significant figures that can be obtained from their use and thus in the precision of measurements. The three meter sticks in figure 3.5 can be used to make successfully more precise measurements of the board. So let's look at this. Well, it says three differently calibrated meter sticks are used to measure the length of a board. A, a meter stick calibrated in a one meter interval, B, a meter stick calibrated in 0.1 meter intervals, and a meter stick calibrated in 0.01 meter uh, intervals. <clears throat> so you can become, you know, which one is more accurate, which one is more precise. Uh, we have had this discussion in class, and it should be pretty routine. Here is a ruler. Uh, I'm giving some extra, uh, extra illustrations from the web. And you can see how this ruler is uh, calibrated. You can see each of the graduations uh, <coughs> for, um, for a measurement. And you can determine the number of significant figures and estimated place values by examining the graduations on the ruler. Here is uh, a, uh, a vernier caliper kind of instrument uh, in the below, in the instrument below. Here we have a ruler in centimeters, and uh, it's divided into millimeters, and then tenth of a millimeter or hundredth of a centimeter. You can be you can measure with the top uh, illustration. So the bottom illustration is the sort of like a vernier caliper, and we'll learn how to read that in class. Rules for determining whether a digit in a measured value is significant: one, every non-zero digit in a reported measurement is assumed to be significant. The measurements 24.7 meters, 0.743 meters, and 714 meters each express a measure of length to three significant figures. Zeros of, number two, zeros appearing between non-zero digits are significant. The measurements 7003 meters, 40.79 meters, and 1.503 meters each have four significant figures. These rules can be used uh, if you're given a measurement and you don't know what the instrument was, where they came from, you can use these and they very, very quickly will help you identify the number of significant figures. Uh, these are just the first two of several rules. So let's look at the rest of the rules. And number three, uh, leftmost zeros appearing in front of non-zero digits are not significant. They act as placeholders. The measurements 0 0.0071 meters, 0.42 or 0 0.42 meter, and 0 0.000099 meters each have only two significant figures. The zeros to the left are not significant. By writing the measurements in scientific notation, 
you can eliminate such placeholder zeros, placeholding zeros. In this case, uh, it would be 7.1 times 10 to the negative 3 meters, 4.2 times 10 to the negative 1 meter, and 9.9 .9 times 10 to the negative 5 meters. You can see that in scientific notation, they only use the significant figure, so it's not going to be a problem uh, when illustrating that fact. Now, <clears throat> number four, zeros at the end of a number and to the right of the decimal point are always significant. The measurement's 43.00 meters, 1.010 meters, and 9.000 meters each have four significant figures. Number five, zeros at the rightmost end of a measurement that lie to the left of an understood decimal point are not significant if they serve as placeholders to show the magnitude of the number or the magnitude of the significant figures. So those are placeholders and you can also use scientific notation to illustrate the fact that uh, the number can be expressed uh, without those placeholders or without insignificant figures. Zeros in the measurements 300 meters, 7,000 meters, and 27,210 meters are not significant. The numbers of the number of significant figures in these values are 1, 1, and 4 respectively. If such zeros were known measured values, however, then they would be significant. For example, if all of the zeros in the measurement 300 meters were significant, writing the value in scientific notation would be 3.00 times 10 to the 2 meters makes it clear that these zeros are significant. It's, however, not the case. So it would be written 3 times 10 to the 2 meters as 300 is written above. So uh, <clears throat> there's one more rule, and uh, that's number six. Number six says there are two situations in which numbers have an unlimited number of significant figures. The first involves counting. If you count 23 people in your classroom, then there are exactly 23 people, and this value has an unlimited number of significant figures. The second situation involves exactly defined quantities such as those found with a system of measurement. When, for example, you write a conversion, 60 minutes equals one hour, or 100 centimeters equals one meter. Each of these numbers has an unlimited number of significant figures, and you shall soon see exact quantities do not affect the process of rounding an answer to the correct number of significant figures. That's going to become very important when we look at calculations involving addition, subtraction, and then multiplication, division. Significant figures in calculations. Suppose you use a calculator to find the area of a floor that measures 7.7 .7 meters by 5.4 meters. The calculator would give an answer of 41.58 square meters. The calculated area is expressed to four significant figures. However, each of the measurements used in the calculation is expressed to only two significant figures. So the answer must also be reported to two significant figures, or 42 meters squared. In general, a calculated answer cannot be more accurate or more precise than the least accurate or least precise measurement from which it was calculated. The calculated value must be rounded to make it consistent with the measurement from which it was calculated. And we'll see the rules for calculating multiplying uh, operations. Uh, to round a number, you must first decide how many significant figures the answer should have. The decision depends on the given measurements and on the mathematical process used to arrive at the answer. Once you know the number of significant figures your answer should have, round to that many digits, counting from the left. If the digit immediately to the right of the last significant digit is less than 5, 
it is simply dropped and the value of the last significant digit stays the same. If the digit in question is 5 or greater, the value of the digit in the last significant place is increased by 1. A very basic way of rounding common, you should be very used to that style of rounding uh, before this year. Here's a sample one, rounding measurements, round off each measurement to the number of significant figures shown in parentheses, write the answers in scientific notation. Uh, very simple, uh, 314.7, uh, and then 87 would be 88, so 8800, and that would be two significant figures, and, and we'll see how that works here. So you can see, um, solve, apply uh, the concepts to this problem. Count from the left and apply the rule to the digit immediately to the right of the digit to which you are rounding. The arrow points to the, to the digit immediately following the last significant digit. So you're going to round to the 7. So it'll be 314.7. In scientific notation, it would be 3.147 times 10 to the 2 because it's 304. So you'd multiply it by 100. So the correct base 10 would be 10 squared. Now, I'm just going to let you look at the next. I'm just simply pointing to the rounding value. Uh, the 7 is going to round the 7 up. And so it'll be 1.8 times 10 to the 3, or that should actually be negative 3. And then the next will be, uh, you're rounding the, not, the 7 up, so it will be 8.8 .8 times 10 to the 3 meters. And uh, that concludes A, B, and C. Converting between metric units, express... 750 decigrams in grams. Multiply the above conversion by 50 grams copper gives the approximate answer of 25 students, which is close to the calculated answer. So it's going to be one student per two grams of copper. Now, let's look at another problem. Addition and subtraction. This is a different method. We uh, Addition and subtraction is different from multiplication and division. The answer to an addition or subtraction calculation should be rounded to the same number of decimal places, not digits, as the measurement with the least number of decimal places. Work through sample problem 3.2 below, which provides an example of rounding to an addition calculation. Significant figures in addition calculate the sum of the three measurements. Give the answer to the correct number of significant figures. Uh, so it'd be 12.52 meters plus 349.0 meters and then 8.24 meters. Another way of looking at this is you you measure to the value with the least precision. The least precision. So you want to analyze, identify the relevant concepts, calculate the sum, and then analyze each measurement to determine the number of decimal places required in the answer. Now, or you could say that the answer must have the same precision as the, the value with the least precision used in the calculation. So here's the calculation. I'm adding the column of numbers, and I can see that 349.0 has the least precision. So I've got to round it to tenths place, so it'll be 369.8 will be the correct answer. Uh, so it has the least precision. Its precision is tenths, as opposed to the others which have one hundredths. So I want to round it to 369.8. So the answer is rounded to 369.8 or 3.698 times 10 to the 2 meters. Notice how I'm rounding. 
and notice that the rounding has not only the correct answer, but it only has one significant figure to the left of the decimal place, and that is true scientific notation as opposed to plain everyday exponential notation. Okay, next, multiplying multiplication and division. In calculations involving multiplication and division, you need to round the answer to the same number of significant figures as the measurement with the least number of significant figures. The position of the decimal point has nothing to do with the rounding process when multiplying and dividing measurements. The position of the decimal point is important only in rounding the answers of addition and subtraction. The position of the decimal point is, is important only in rounding relative to addition and subtraction. Let me read that last sentence again. The position of the decimal point is important only in rounding the answers of addition or subtraction problems. Multiplication works with the number of, least number of significant figures, addition and subtraction, least number of decimal places. Or multiplication and division, you round the answer to the uh, accuracy of the least accurate value. Now, the least accurate value is determined by the value with the least number of significant figures. So, in addition to subtraction, it's least number of decimal places or least precise value. In multiplication and division, it's the least number of significant figures or the least accurate value. So, some practice problems. Significant figures in multiplication and division perform the following operations, give the answers to the correct number of significant figures. So A is going to be 7.55 times 0 0.34, 2.10 times 0 0.70, and 2.4526 2 divided by 8.4. So again, it's the least accurate or the least number of significant figures. So you're going to round all of them to two significant figures. Okay, analyze, identify the relevant concepts. Uh, perform the required math operation and then analyze each of the original numbers to determine the correct number of significant figures required in the answer. Pretty straightforward multiplication and division. It's just the least number of significant figures in a measurement. That's what you round it to, uh, or least accurate, whatever the case may be. You see, you can't, you can't use 20 instruments used to find the cure for cancer and then in terms of measuring length, you use a Birkenstock sandal. The accuracy or precision of your any calculation you perform is limited by that weak link, that, that sandal. So you could have used billions of dollars of instrumentation and your, your answer is only as good as the as the worst instrument used to do to spend years doing all of these experiments very important so it says round the answers to match the measurement with the least number of significant figures or the least accurate well a 0.34 is the least accurate and has two significant figures so the answer would be 2.6 meters squared B, 0.70 meters, has two significant figures, so the answer would be 1.5 meters squared. Remember, you round to the number of significant figures and the least accurate value. Uh, C, 8.4 has two significant figures, so you round it to 0.29 meters, and that's it. Now, uh, Let's continue. That's only the end of section 3.1. I'm not even sure we're completely finished with 3.1. But addition and subtraction, you round to the least precise, and multiplication and division, you round to the least accurate. Now, here are some mile markers. They are specific. They are, uh, they have as many seeming figures as you want them to have. Carrington is 44 miles, specifically. Uh, but how was that measured? Was that measured with a tape, with an odometer? Is it uh, as significant as one might think? Well, it depends on how it was measured. 
Are we there yet? The international system of units. You may have asked this question during a long road trip with your family or friends. To find out how much farther you have to go, you can read the roadside signs that list destinations and their distances. In the sign shown here, or in the previous slide, however, the distances are listed in numbers with no units attached. Is Carrington 44 kilometers or 44 miles? Without the units, you can't be sure. When you make a measurement, you must assign the correct units to the numerical values. Without the units, it is impossible to communicate the measurement clearly to others. Let's read that again. Is Carrington 44 kilometers or 44 miles away? Without the units, you can't be sure. When you make a measurement, you must assign the correct units to the numerical value. Without the units, it is impossible to communicate the measurement clearly to others. You will receive zero credit for an answer if it's not identified with the correct units. So please beware. All measurements depend on units that serve as reference standards. The standards of measurement used in science are those of the metric system. The metric system is important because of its simplicity and ease of use. All metric units are based on multiples of 10. As a result, you can convert between units easily. The metric system was originally established in France in 1795. The International System of Units, abbreviated SI after the French name Le Système International des Units, is a revised version of the metric system. The SI was adopted by International Agreement in 1960. There are seven SI base units which are listed in Table 1. So that's the, pardon me for my mispronunciation of the French, but it's the International System of Units. And here is Table 1, SI base units, and you can see we have length, mass, temperature, time, amount of substance, that's mole, luminous intensity, that's candela, CD, and electric current, which are in ampere, and the symbol is A, that's the amount of current. So you have meter, kilogram, kelvin, seconds, moles, candela, and ampere. From these base units, all other SI units are measured can be derived. The five SI base units commonly used by chemists are the meter, the kilogram, the kelvin, the second, and the mole. All measured quantities can be reported in SI. These are, by the way, the standard units, not the derived ones. Sometimes, however, non-SI units are preferred for convenience or for practical reasons. In this textbook, you will learn about both SI and non-SI units. America uses a lot of non-SI units, by the way. As you already know, you don't measure length in kilograms or mass in centimeters. Different quantities require different units. Before you make a measurement, you must be familiar with the units corresponding to the quantity that you are trying to measure. Units of length, size, is an important property of matter. The SI, the basic unit of length or linear measure, is the meter. All measurements of length can be expressed in meters. The length of a page in this book or the screen that you're looking at on your computer is about one-fourth of a meter. For very large and very small lengths, however, it may be more convenient to use a unit of length that has a prefix. Table 2 lists the prefixes in common use. For example, the prefix milli means one thousandth. So the millimeter is one thousandth of a meter or point zero zero one. The hyphen measures about one millimeter. Here is a table of commonly used metric prefixes that you should write down uh, in your notes for your test. You're going to need these. So you have mega, kilo, deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, and pico. Some people say pico, but pico would be fine.
and that's the factor on the far right hand side. For large distances, it is usually most appropriate to express measurements in kilometers. The prefix kilo means 1,000, so one kilometer equals 1,000 meters. A standard marathon distance race of about 42,000 meters is more conveniently expressed as 42 kilometers, 42 100 meters. Common metric units of length include the centimeter, the kilometer, table 3 summarizes the relationships among metric units of length, units of volume. The, the space occupied by any sample of matter is called its volume. You calculate the volume of any cubic or rectangular solid by multiplying its length with by its height and the volume is a derived unit as a result. <clears throat> the unit of volume is thus derived from units of length. The SI units of volume is the amount of space occupied by a cube that is one meter along each edge. This volume is a cubic meter. An automatic dishwasher has a volume of about one cubic meter. A more convenient unit of volume for everyday use is the liter, a non-SI unit. A liter is the volume of a cube that is 10 centimeters along each side. 10 by 10 by 10, that's 1,000 cubic centimeters or 1 liter. A decimeter is equal to 10 centimeters, so 1 liter is also equal to 1 cubic decimeter. A smaller non-SI unit of volume is the millimeter. One milliliter is one thousandth of a liter. Thus there are one thousand milliliters in one liter. Here is uh, figure 6, 3.6. These photographs above give you some idea of the relative sizes of some different units of volume. A, the volume of 20 drops of liquid from a medicine dropper is approximately one milliliter. B, a sugar cube is about one centimeter on each side and has a volume of about approximately one cubic centimeter. A sugar cube uh, is again one, one centimeter on each side and is a cubic centimeter. That's the same thing as a milliliter by the way. Note that one milliliter is about the same as one cubic centimeter. A gallon of milk has about twice the volume of a two liter bottle of soda, approximately eight pounds as well. You may want to try to convert that to kilograms, see if you can understand the relationship between kilograms and pounds. Because one liter is defined as 1,000 cubic centimeters, one milliliter is one milliliter and one cubic centimeter are the same volume. The units milliliter and cubic centimeter are thus used interchangeably. Common metric units of volume include the liter, milliliter, cubic centimeter, and microliter. Table 4 summarizes the relationships among these units of volume. There are many devices for measuring liquid volumes, including graduated cylinders, pipettes, burettes, volumetric flasks, and syringes. Note that the volume of any solid, liquid, or gas will change with temperature, although the change is much more dramatic for gases. Consequently accurate, consequently accurate volume measuring devices are calibrated at a given temperature, usually 20 degrees Celsius, which is about normal room temperature. That calibration will be very important as we do more and more lab work. Table 4, here we have liter, milliliter, cubic centimeter, microliter, and these are examples of various metric units of volume that are pretty common in the chemistry world. So this is another 
uh, chart you might want to put in your notes for your test. I don't give any data from constants or anything else like that for your test. Units of mass. The mass of an object is measured in comparison to a standard mass of one kilogram, which is the basic SI unit of mass. A kilogram was originally defined as the mass of one liter of liquid water at four degrees Celsius. Remember, four degrees Celsius is important because that's the temperature at which water is most dense. A cube of water at four degrees Celsius measuring 10 centimeters on each edge would have a volume of one liter and a mass of 1,000 grams or one kilogram. A gram is there, therefore one thousandth of a kilogram, the mass of one cubic centimeter of water at four degrees Celsius is one gram. Common metric units of mass include the kilogram, gram, milligram, and microgram. The relationship among units of mass are shown in table five. You can use, let me extend the time here, you can use a platform balance to measure the mass of an object. Well, that was a little bit better. I extended the time. Now, here is a table, table five. Again, important information. It shows metric units of mass from the kilogram, gram, milligram, and microgram, and the equivalent uh, in either grams or kilograms. And then some examples of each relative to a dollar bill, a small textbook, one kilogram, that must be a very small textbook, 2.2 pounds, 10 grains of salt, etc. The object is placed on one side of the balance. We're talking about a platform balance now. And standard masses are added to the other side until the balance beam is level. The unknown mass is equal to the sum of the standard masses. Laboratory balances range from very sensitive instruments with a maximum capacity of only a few milligrams to devices for measuring quantities in kilograms. An analytical balance is used to measure uh, objects of less than 100 grams and can determine mass to the nearest 0 0.000 one or 0.1 milligrams. The astronaut shown on the surface of the moon in figure seven weighs one-sixth of what he weighs on Earth. The reason for this difference is that the force of gravity on Earth is about six times what it is on the moon. So that's why the astronauts can jump etc., large distances when they go play on the moon. And here is figure seven, an astronaut weight, an astronaut's weight on the moon is one-sixth as much as it is on Earth. Earth, Earth exerts six times the force of gravity as the moon does. And we'll study this a bit in physics. We'll study uh, the relationship between mass and weight. Weight includes gravity. Gravity times mass is the weight. Weight is a force that measures the pull on a given mass by gravity. Weight, a measure of force, is different from mass, which is a measure of the quantity of matter. Although the weight of an object can change with its location, its mass remains constant regardless of its location. Objects can thus become weightless, but they can never become massless. Units of temperature, when you hold a glass of hot water, the glass feels hot because heat transfers from the glass to your hand. When you hold an ice cube, it feels cold because heat transfers from your hand to the ice cube. Temperature is a measure of how hot or cold something is, something we'll study a great deal later. An object's temperature determines the direction of heat transfer. When two objects of different temperatures are in contact, heat moves from the object at the higher temperature to the object at the lower temperature. 
Almost all substances expand with an increase in temperature and contract as the temperature decreases. A very important exception is water. These properties are the basis for the common liquid in glass thermometer. The liquid in the thermometer expands and contracts more than the volume of the glass, producing changes in the column height of liquid. Figure 8 shows a few different types of thermometers. Several thermometer scales with, with different units have been devised. And we'll do an experiment, uh, we'll do a mathematical experiment with thermometers. Thermometers are used to measure temperature. A, a liquid in glass thermometer contains alcohol or mineral spirits. B, a dial thermometer contains a coiled bimetallic strip. A, C, a Galileo thermometer contains several glass bulbs that are calibrated to sink or float depending on the temperature. The Galileo thermometer shown uses the Fahrenheit. It uses the Fahrenheit. That's, that's kind of an American thing. It uses the Fahrenheit scale, which sets the freezing point of water at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and the boiling point of water at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And you know what the melting and boiling of, of in Celsius should be. On the Kelvin scale, the freezing point of water is 273.15 Kelvin, and the boiling point of water is 373.15 Kelvin. Notice that with the Kelvin scale, the degree sign is not used. Figure 9 on the next page compares the Celsius and Kelvin scales. A change of 1 degree on the Celsius scale is equivalent to 1 degree on the Kelvin scale. The zero point on the Kelvin scale, 0K, or absolute zero is equal to negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. For problems in this text, you can round negative two point sorry, negative 273.15 degrees Celsius to negative 273 degrees Celsius. So you can round it, it's a lot easier. Uh, because one degree on the Celsius scale is equivalent to one Kelvin on the Kelvin scale, converting from one temperature to another is easy. You simply add or subtract 273, as shown in the following equations. So those equations you should also write down in your book, and that will help you interpret problems uh, relative to converting between Celsius and Kelvin. Uh, figure 9, these thermometers show a comparison of the Celsius and Kelvin temperature scales. Note that 1 degree Celsius change on the Celsius scale is equivalent or equal to 1 Kelvin change on the Kelvin scale. The, the Fahrenheit thermometer uh, is about, it takes about 1.8 Fahrenheit uh, degrees to equal 1 uh, Celsius, thereabouts. Uh, units of energy is next. Units of energy. Figure 10 on the next page shows a house equipped with solar panels. The solar panels convert the radiant energy from the sun into electrical energy that can be used to heat, water, and power appliances. Some of it can also be sold back to the electrical company. Energy is the capacity to do work or to produce heat. Like any other quantity, energy can be measured. The joule and the calorie are common units of energy. The joule is the SI unit of energy. It is named after the English physicist James Prescott Joule, 1818 to 1889. One calorie is the quantity of, small c, is the quantity of heat that raises the temperature of one gram of pure water by one degree Celsius. Conversions between joule and calories can be carried out using the following relationship. One joule equals 
0 0.2390 calories and 1 calorie equals 1.4.184 joules. Here is figure 10. Photoelectric panels convert solar energy into electricity. And again, the excess electricity that you don't use can be sent back. Can be Well, not sent back, but it, because it's made at the house, it can be given or sold back to the electrical company. So it's pretty cool stuff, the panels, and you can get rebates and the government can help pay for your installation, etc. And if you're going to own the house for many years, it is a sure bet for an investment. Here are examples of monies are from around the world. I see the pound on the right side. Uh, a lot of Europe uses the euro. Some countries in Europe are not on the euro. Uh, Poland is not. The Czech Republic is not. I believe Hungary is also not. But uh, many countries are on the euro. And there's other examples of currency from around the world listed on this particular slide. Uh, conversion problems. Perhaps you have traveled abroad or are planning to do so. If, if so, you know, or soon will discover, that different countries have different currencies. As a tourist, exchanging money is essential to the enjoyment of your trip. After all, you must pay for your meals, hotel, transportation, gift purchases, and tickets to exhibits and events because each country's currency compares differently with the US dollar. Knowing how to convert currency units correctly is very important. Conversion problems are readily solved by a problem-solving approach called dimensional analysis. So, fair enough. You need to be able to do dimensional analysis to some small degree. Well, dimensional analysis uses the concept of the factor of one. Let's look at it. If you think about any number of everyday situations, you will realize that a quantity can usually be expressed in several different ways. For example, consider the monetary amount one dollar. One dollar equals four quarters, equals ten dimes, equals twenty nickels, equals one hundred pennies. These are all expressions of measurements of the same amount of money. The same thing is true of scientific quantities. For example, consider a distance that is measured exactly one meter. One meter equals 10 decimeters, equals 100 centimeters, equals 1,000 millimeters. These are different ways to express the same length. Whenever two measurements are equivalent, a ratio of the two measurements will equal one or unity. Conversion factors continued. For example, you can divide both sides of the equation, one meter equals 100 centimeters, by one meter or by 100 centimeters as shown. A conversion factor is a ratio of equivalent measurements. The ratio is 100 centimeters over one meter or 100 or sorry or one meter over 100 centimeters are examples of conversion factors. In a conversion factor the measurement in the numerator on the top is equivalent, not equal to, but equivalent to the measurement in the denominator or the uh, what's on the bottom. Make sure you can differentiate the two terms that, that I'm going to say. Equals and equivalent. They're similar but yet very different. Equivalent and equal. Make sure you can differentiate between those two terms. Very important. The conversion factors above are read 100 centimeters per meter or 100 meters per 100 centimeters. Figure 11 on the next slide illustrates another way to look at the relationships in a conversion factor. Notice that the smaller number is part of the measurement with the larger unit. That is, a meter is physically larger than a centimeter. Very, very critical in, di in dividing one with another relative to dimensional analysis. Here's a slide you should be able to uh, meditate on. 
uh, figure 11, the two parts of a conversion factor, the numerator, the denominator, are equal. One meter and 100 centimeters. Smaller number, larger number, larger unit, smaller unit. But they are a conversion factor, and the numerator is equivalent to the denominator. Equivalents and equals. Make sure you can differentiate. The larger number is part of the measurement with the smaller unit. Conversion factors are useful in solving problems in which a given measurement must be expressed in some other unit of measure. When a measurement is multiplied by a conversion factor, the numerical value is generally changed, but the actual size of the quantity measured remains the same. For example, even though the numbers in the measurements 1 gram and 10 decigrams differ, both measurements represent the same mass. In addition, conversion factors within a system of measurement are defined quantities or exact quantities. Therefore, they have an unlimited number of significant figures unlimited number of significant figures. Let me say that again. Therefore, they have an unlimited number of significant figures and do not affect the rounding of a calculated answer. Remember, when you multiply, divide, add, subtract measurements. In these computer images of atoms, distance is marked off in nanometers. So when you're talking about a computer-generated image of atoms using a tunneling, scanning, tunneling microscope, you're talking about the range of, um, of nanometers or billionth of a meter, 10 to the ninth, 10 to the ninth. Here are some additional examples of pairs of conversion factors written from equivalent measurements. The relationship between grams and kilograms is 1,000 grams equals one kilogram. The conversion factors are 1,000 grams over one kilogram and one kilogram over 1,000 grams. And the scale of the micrograph in figure 312 is in nanometers using the relationship one, oh, sorry, 10 to the ninth nanometers equals one meter. You can write the following conversions. And the scale of the micrograph in figure uh, 3.12 is in nanometers. Using the relationship of 10 to the ninth nanometers equals 1 meter, you can write the following conversion, which is listed there. 1 meter over 10 to the ninth nanometers and the reciprocal of that. And common volumetric units used in chemistry include the liter and microliter. The relationship of 1 liter equals 10 to the sixth microliters or one millionth yields the following conversion factors. Based on what you know about metric prefixes, you should be able to easily write conversion factors that relate equivalent metric quantities. And you're responsible for that. So write down the metric conversions in your chapter notes if you want to use them on your test. I will not supply them. They have to be actually written by you and uh, used on your test as you need them. Dimensional analysis. No single method is best for solving every type of problem. Several good approaches are available and generally one of the best is dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is a way to analyze and solve problems using the units or dimensions of the measurements. The best way to explain this problem-solving technique is to use it to solve an everyday situation. There is usually more than one way to solve a problem. When you first read sample problem 5, you may have thought about different and equally correct ways to approach and solve the problem. Some problems are easily worked with simple algebra. Uh, oftentimes, uh, a simple proportional relationship 
works better than dimensional analysis, but this is just a technique that is taught uh, and that uh, you could use if you wish. It's not required that you use it. Using dimensional analysis, how many, how many seconds are in a workday that lasts exactly eight hours? So here's the knowns, here's the unknown. I want to convert it to seconds, and I have the time worked as eight hours, one hour is 60 minutes, and one minute is 60 seconds. So let's look at the, uh, the answer to the, this particular problem. We're going to analyze it. The first conversion factor must be written with the unit hours in the denominator. The second conversion factor must be written with the unit minutes in the denominator. This will provide the desired unit seconds in the answer. Calculate, solve for the unknown. Start with the, start with the known, 8 hours. Use the first relationship, 1 hour equals 60 minutes, to write a conversion factor that expresses 8 hours in minutes. The unit hours must be in the denominator so that the known unit will cancel. Then use the second conversion factor to change the unit minutes into unit seconds. Or you can just say there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. That's also fine. 60 times 60. Uh, as you get more sophisticated with these problems, you may just cut to the chase and use 3,600 seconds is in one hour. So the conversion factor must have the unit, unit minutes in the denominator. The conversion factors can be used together in a simple overall calculation. So it's 8 hours times 60 minutes over 1 hour times 60 seconds over 1 minute, and that's going to be 28,800 seconds, or 2.8800 uh, times 10 to the 4th seconds. Uh, and why am, I, uh, why am I using all of those significant figures? Well, I just wanted to, uh, to use them. Uh, you could just simply say, well, it's 8 hours, so you can only have 1, so it would be 30,000, or 3 times 10 to the 4th seconds. But I want to build this little by little for you. So does the result make sense? The answer has the desired unit in seconds. Since the second is a small unit of time, you should expect a large number of seconds in 8 hours. So is 8, is eight hours a measurement where you're going to have significant figures? So that's something that should be, uh, should be considered, okay? Before you actually do, do the actual arithmetic, it is a good idea to make sure that the units cancel and that the numerator and denominator of each conversion factor are equal to each other. The answer is exact since the given measurement and each of the conversion factors is exact. So next we're going to look at sample problem six using dimensional analysis. The directions for an experiment ask each student to measure 1.84 grams of copper wire. The only copper wire available is a spool with a mass of 50 grams. How many students can do the experiment before the copper runs out? So we've got to set up some relationships. What relationships are we going to actually set up so that we can write equivalencies uh, that will cancel and convert to the appropriate units or the appropriate dimensions. Let's read it again. The directions for an experiment ask each student to measure 1.84 grams of copper wire. The only copper wire available is a spool with a mass of 50 grams. How many students can do the experiment before the copper runs out? So let's write some knowns that we have here. The, no, the mass of copper available is 50 grams. Each student needs 1.84 grams of copper or 1.84 grams of copper per student. The unknown is the number of students. From the known mass of copper, calculate the number of students that can do the experiment by using the appropriate conversion factor. The desired conversion is mass of copper to number of students. So there you have all of the knowns and the unknowns, and also a hint as to how it may be calculated. Okay, now the next thing we want to do is set up an equation with the, with the conversion factors uh, fit in 
to the equation and then we'll see if the the unit labels as it goes through cancel and the ones you want to add are added. Uh, it says because students because students is the desired unit for the answer the conversion factor should be written with students in the numerator. Multiply the mass of copper by the conversion factors. So you're going to divide by 1.84 multiplied by one student and you get 27.174 students or just 27 students. Um, if it was really 50.0 grams, you know, the rule says, says, note that because students cannot be fractional, the result is shown rounded down to a whole number. So it's going to be difficult to say, well, 27.2 students, that would be kind of weird. So it's rounded down. So it's, you know, sometimes the number of significant figures is difficult to, to understand, but it should make sense. For instance, if you do a conversion, the number of significant figures you start with generally are the number of significant figures you end with. But sometimes if it's, it can be a little bit difficult to determine. And we'll talk about that in class. Please ask me. Does the result make sense? The unit of the answer, students, is the one desired. The number of students, 27, seems to be a reasonable answer. You can make an approximate calculation using the following conversion factor. One student over two grams copper. Multiplying the above conversion factor by 50 grams copper gives the approximate answer of 25 students, which is close to the calculated answer. Very close to the calculated answer. Actually, not bad at all. Dimensional analysis provides you with an alternate approach to problem solving. In either case, you should choose the problem solving method that works best converting between units. In chemistry, as in many other subjects, you often need to express a measurement in a unit different from the one given or measured initially. Problems in which a measurement with one unit is converted to an equivalent measurement with another unit are easily solved using dimensional analysis. Suppose that a laboratory experiment requires seven decigrams of magnesium metal and 100 students will do the experiment. So what does that mean? So let's look at the next slide to see if we can make sense of that. How many grams of magnesium should your teacher have on hand? Multiplying 100 students by 7.5 decigrams per student gives you 750 decigrams but then you must convert decigrams to grams. Sample problem seven shows you how to do the conversion. Multi-step problems. Many complex tasks in your day, everyday life are best handled by breaking them down into manageable parts. For example, if you were cleaning a car, you might first vacuum the inside, then wash the exterior then dry the exterior, and finally put a fresh coat of wax on. Similarly, many complex word problems are more easily solved by breaking the solution down into steps. Breaking it down into steps. It's always, it's usually the best way to do the word problems. Converting between metric units, example problem 7, express 750 decigrams in grams. You're listing the knowns and the unknowns there. The desired conversion is there using the expression related relating the units. 10 decigrams equals 1 gram. Multiply the given mass by the proper conversion factor. And then let's see if the problem can be solved. Why don't you stop this, put this on pause, and see if you can get the answer. And I'm just going to let this run and see what happens. Okay? Good luck.
All right, the correct answer is 75 grams. The decigrams cancels. I'm multiplying it by the conversion factor of 1 gram over 10 decigrams. Decigrams in the denominator. Evaluate. Does the result make sense? Because the unit gram represents a larger mass than the unit decigram, it makes sense that the number of grams is less than the number given number of decigrams. The unit of the known decigram cancels, and the answer has the correct unit G. The answer also has the correct number of significant figures. Remember, in a conversion, the number of significant figures you begin with is, are the number you end with unless there's some other reason that might, that might negate that. When converting between units, it is often necessary to use more than one conversion factor. Sample problem 8 illustrates the use of multiple conversion factors. Converting complex units. Many common measurements are expressed as a ratio of two units. For example, the results of international car races often give average lap speeds in kilometers per hour. You measure the densities of solids and liquids in grams per cubic centimeter. You measure the gas mileage in a car in miles per gallon of gasoline. Difficult for an international student to use uh, books like this because it's, they're very American measurements, some of them in terms of the examples. But anyway, a, a, a gallon is about 4 liters and a mile is uh, 1.6 kilometers. Uh, converting between metric units, what is 0 0.073 centimeters in micrometers? That's sample problem 3.8. Analyze, list the knowns and the unknowns. Everything is there. The desired conversion is from centimeters to micrometers. The problem can be solved in a two-step conversion. As the plot thickens, we go from one step to two steps. And there it is. You can convert from centimeters to meters. I call it kind of like going back to the origin. And then you're going to go from meters to micrometers. There is a way, in, when you get clever at this, you can indeed go directly from centimeters to micrometers, or you can go direct, because it's, uh, it's, there is a way to do it uh, if you think base 10. Because a micrometer is much smaller unit than a centimeter, the answer should be numerically larger. Numerically larger than, not, 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 this, not bigger, but equivalent, but it looks larger. Numerically larger than the given measurement. The units have canceled correctly, and the answer has the correct number of significant figures. If you use dimensional analysis, Converting these complex units is just as easy as converting simple units. It will take multiple steps to arrive at an answer. Converting ratios of units. Sample problem 3.9. The mass per unit volume of a substance is a property called density. The density of manganese, a metallic element, is 7.21 grams per cubic centimeter. What is the density of manganese expressed in units kilograms per cubic meter? Kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, here are the knowns and the unknowns. The desired conversion is grams to grams per cubic centimeter to kilograms per cubic meter. That's actually what we use in physics. We use kilograms per cubic meter. The mass unit in the numerator must be changed from grams to uh, kilograms. Uh, in the denominator, the volume unit must be changed from cubic centimeters to cubic meters. Note that the relationship between cubic meters and cubic centimeters was determined from the relationship between centimeters and meters, cubing the relationship as shown below. So 10 to the 6 centimeters cubed equals 1 meter cubed. Uh, because the physical size of the volume unit cubic meters is so large, so much larger than cubic centimeters, 
10 to the 6 times, the calculated volume of the density should be larger. The, the magnitude should be larger than the given volume, value, even though the mass unit is also larger, 10 to the third times. The units canceled, the, the units canceled, the conversion factors are correct, and the answer has the correct ratio of units. So it is a, another successful flight to the moon. Oh, sorry, we're just doing dimensional analysis. Uh, again, uh, when I teach physics, I'm not real happy with the title of this dimensional analysis. Uh, but anyway, we'll call it what it is. Okay, here's a uh, lake, a swamp, with a rather pretty flower. Uh, I'm not sure how this ha what this has to do with the text coming up, but let's see if we can make sense of such a beautiful picture. It looks like a nice summer's day somewhere in the on the planet earth i'm not sure where but somewhere okay let's look at uh, the next problem all right density have you ever wondered why some objects float in water aha while others sink if you think that these lily pads float because they are lightweight you are only partially correct the ratio of the mass of an object to its volume can be used to determine whether an object floats or sinks in water. For pure water at 4 degrees Celsius, this ratio is 1 gram per cubic centimeter. If an object has a mass to volume ratio less than 1 gram per cubic centimeter, it will float in water. If an object has a mass to volume ratio greater than this value, it will sink. So that's a nice rule of thumb. Uh, less dense floats, more dense sinks. Pretty good rule of thumb. Now, determining density. Perhaps someone has tricked you with this question. Which is heavier, a pound of lead or a pound of feathers? Most people would not give the question much thought and would incorrectly answer lead. Of course, a pound of lead has the same mass as a pound of feathers if it's on the same planet and in the same latitude or the same height above the earth. What concept instead of mass are people really thinking of when they answer this question? Most people are incorrectly applying a perfectly correct idea, namely that if a piece of lead and a feather of the same volume are weighed, the lead would have a greater mass than the feather. It would take a much larger volume of feathers to equal the mass of a given volume of lead. So uh, people confuse volume and therefore they confuse really density. So remember things can float in air too if they're less dense than air. The important relationship in this case is between the object's mass and its volume. The relationship is called density. Density is the ratio of the mass of an object to its volume. A 10 cubic, center, cubic centimeter piece of lead, for example, has a mass of 114 grams. What then is the density of the lead? You can calculate it by substituting the mass and volume into the equation. You get 11.4 grams per cubic centimeter. Note that when the mass is measured in grams and the volume in cubic centimeters, density has units of grams per cubic centimeter. That's generally what we'll use in chemistry, grams per milliliter, grams per cubic centimeter. The actual correct SI units are actually kilogram per cubic meter, and that's what we use in physics. We we'll use kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, figure 13, a 10 gram sample of pure water has less volume than 10 grams of lithium but more volume than 10 grams of lead. The faces of the cubes are shown actual size. Here I have uh, 10 grams of lithium as a large volume, so it's not very dense. Uh, 10 grams of water and then 10 grams of lead. So do the math. Note that when the mass is measured in grams, the volume in cubic centimeters Density has units of grams per cubic centimeter. Figure 13 
on page 89 compares the density of three substances. Why does each 10 gram sample have a different volume? The volumes vary because the substances have different densities. Density is an intensive or characteristic physical property that depends only on the composition of the substance, not on the size of the sample. With a mixture, density can vary because the composition of a mixture can vary. What do you think will happen if corn oil is poured into a glass containing corn syrup? Using table 6, you can see that the density of corn oil is less than the density of corn syrup. Again, this is for your perusal. This is uh, densities of some common materials, gold, mercury, lead, aluminum, table sugar, corn syrup, water, 4 degrees Celsius, the density is 1, uh, corn oil, ice, ethanol, and gasoline. Gold is the most dense in that chart at 19.3, and gasoline is 0.66 to 0.69, and water is 1, of course. Corn oil is close at 0.922. And that's all grams per cubic centimeter. For that reason, the oil floats on top of the syrup, as shown in figure 14 on the next slide. You have probably seen a helium-filled balloon rapidly rise to the ceiling when it is released. Whether a gas-filled balloon will sink or rise when released depends on how the density of the gas compares with the density of the air. Helium is less dense than air. So a helium-filled balloon rises. The density of various gases is in table are in are listed in table six. So table six will look at the various gases. Now question are there gases that are more dense than air? Are there gases that are more dense than air. Okay, because, uh, table 14. Because of differences in density, corn oil floats on top of corn syrup. So I have some uh, uh, density columns here from the web that might come in handy uh, when trying to understand this. Uh, they are kind of cool actually and uh, not as easy to make as you might think, but they can be done. They can easily be done, but it takes some patience and some uh, slow and some slow movements. You know, you got to pour that stuff in very carefully, very very carefully. Density and temperature. Exper experiments show that the volume of most substances increases as the temperature increases. Meanwhile, the mass remains the same despite the temperature and volume changes. Remember that density is the ratio of an object's mass to its volume. So if the volume changes with, with temperature while the mass remains constant, then the density must also change with temperature. The density of a substance generally decreases as its temperature increases. As you will learn in chapter 15, water is an important exception. Over a certain range of temperatures, the volume of water increases as its temperature decreases. Ice or solid water floats because it is less dense than liquid water. Here is calculating density, sample problem 10. A copper penny has a mass of 3.1 grams and a volume of 0.35 cubic centimeters. What is the density of the copper? So you're going to find your knowns and your unknowns, and then you're going to have your equation. Density equals mass uh, in grams over volume in cubic centimeters. And you're going to put in the mass, 3.1 grams, and then the appropriate volume. And then you're going to get 8.8571 grams per cubic centimeter. Or, uh, putting it another way, you're going to round it to the proper number of significant figures, and the density will be 8.9 grams per cubic centimeter, rounded to two significant figures. So, you've got to make sure that the measurements 
the accuracy and precision of the measurements, in this case the accuracy because it's division, are properly illustrated in the answer. A piece of copper with a volume of about 0.3 cubic centimeters of copper has a mass of about 3 grams. Thus, about three times that volume of copper, one cubic centimeter should have a mass three times larger, about nine grams. This estimate agrees with the calculated results, so the problem is successfully concluded. All right, this next problem, uh, using density to calculate volume, I'm going to let this run, see if you can make some sense out of it. Uh, put it on pause. If you have a question, write it down. Ask me in class. I may even give some extra credit to those of you who have a question, actual question written down. So I'll let this run for, say, two minutes and see what you can do with it. Okay, I'll be right back. Have fun. Okay, so you have two Sinuian figures. You use the, you started with two, you end with two. You use the reciprocal of the density because you wanted to ca uh, cancel mass. And you're left with 1.3 cubic centimeters. So very straightforward. Uh, easy. What I did was I kind of did it both ways. I used simply a simple division uh, and uh, did it that way. So. Either way, it's fine. Next, uh, you want to evaluate, because the mass of 10.3 grams of silver has a volume of 1 cubic centimeter, it makes sense that 14 grams of silver would have a volume slightly larger than 1 cubic centimeter. The answer has two steaming figures because the given mass has two steaming figures. So all is well and a fairly straightforward problem. Uh, very simple, just you got to follow the rules and simply don't break them. Analytical chemists focus on making quantitative measurements. They must be familiar with many analytical techniques uh, to work successfully on a wide variety of tasks. As an analytical chemist, you would spend your time making measurements and calculations to solve laboratory and mathematical research problems. You could, for example, be involved in analyzing the composition of biomolecules. Pharmaceutical companies need people to analyze the composition of medicines and research new combinations of compounds to use as drugs. Uh, there's also, it makes it look like they're, you know, just doing good for mankind. Oftentimes drug companies will only make something if they can sell it and make a profit, which certainly makes sense, of course. As an analytical chemist, you must be able to think creatively and develop new means of, for finding solutions. Many exciting new fields, such as biomedicine and biochemistry, are now hiring analytical chemists. More traditional areas, including industrial manufacturers, also employ uh, 
uh, analytical chemists to make sure the products are, are good. The educational background you need to enter this field is quite extensive. You would need advanced chemical training, including organic chemistry and quantitative chemistry, as well as some training in molecular biology and computer operation. A master's degree in chemistry may be required, and certain positions require PhD. So, if you, unless you want to wash test tubes, you're going to want an advanced degree if you want to be an analytical chemist. That concludes the lecture. Everything you need to do well in this unit is uh, on the web, and uh, good luck. And um, make sure that you write down questions if you... We are finished. Everything that you need to be successful is made available to you. And if you write down questions that you have and you show me the source of those questions, I will give you extra credit. Let me say that again. If you write down questions about information you don't understand and show me the source of those questions, I shall give you extra credit. It's not what you don't know that's important. It's what you do know. But in order to find what you do know, you have to first examine what you don't know. And I can help you with that. And it is the difference between a student who wants to learn and a student who is learning because somebody said it's important. So work hard. This is a college preparatory course. I will treat you like that. However, I will grade you as a high school student. But it's important to challenge yourself in every unit in chemistry.